So my role in my firm today is I speak at a lot of these kind of events and do book signings. And there's a theme I'm hearing, no matter what industry I'm speaking to. It's the window we're in now, which I call the saturation. What the hell is going on in this world, right? That is a feeling of a lot of the places I go. What is happening around here? Let me describe that. Maybe this is you, right? We got more initiatives than we can, as we say in the South, shake a stick at, right? What's really important? How do you know, right? I talked yesterday about strategy and execution, right? And it's so ambiguous and nebulous because how do I discern what's really important? We're in that meeting mania. Look, if you're one of the folks, when you look at your outlook at the beginning of a week or at the beginning of the day, and in your inside voice, you say, how am I going to get what? Work Any work done, right? Because I'm literally in meetings all day. That's you, right? We're micro-reporting of data. What did I say when I began talking? It's not about the data. You take nothing else. Now, that'll horrify the people with boost in there, right? It is not about the data. It's about the system of use. And we haven't defined the system of use. What we do is we build the next organic report, right? Well, I want this report to tell me these things, right? We overwhelm the organization with a hidden factory generating charts and graphs no one cares about. What that's led to that I'm hearing is teams that, I don't want to use the word dysfunctional, but there is a degree of dysfunction. And I describe that degree of dysfunction as selective engagement. If you're taking notes, let me tell you what I mean by that. Right? Our data says that in a team of 20 people, you can physically validate six as engaged. Six. Where are the other 14? Mm -hmm. We're going to explore that in our minutes this morning. Right? I think we've fallen into a pattern, ladies and gentlemen, of leadership. And I can speak personally to this because this was the model in my early career that got you rewarded and recognized and promoted, and I call it leadership by the three P's. Your physical proximity, your powers of persuasion, and your positional authority. And a lot of us, when you think about how you got stuff done, you used your physical proximity to drive a sense of urgency. You used your powers of persuasion to go to those individuals who you knew were engaged, those six, right, that I could defer to and rely on and go to. And you built a way of work that was predicated not on a culture of collective accountability, but rather a method of selective engagement. And if all else fails, if you can't be there and you couldn't have your powers of persuasion, you had the positional authority to get stuff done. And listen, I'll be honest, I was in a company last week, family-owned business. They said, Shane, I see nothing wrong with that, right? Those three Ps of proximity, persuasion, and position, it's how we built this organization. It's third generation, 110 years. I don't see a problem with that, right? Well, let me be clear. Those three Ps are not compatible with the cultural cornerstones I talked about when I began talking. They are not compatible with clarity, connectivity, and consistency. They're not. So what's powering performance in your organization? That's the timeline I want you thinking about. I want you looking, as you hear me talk in my remaining minutes, I want you to ask yourself, is that my organization? Am I that red cape leader that I put the red cape on, swoop in, save the day, and that's how things get done, right? Am I worried about, within that, everyone feeling good, right? Does my HR partner always talk about, well, how do we get people to feel better about themselves, their boss, their team, their future, right? Is it about giving people stuff? Are you caught up in, let's give folks the next benefit and the next you know, flexible work hours and the next open office? I mean, it's all about what we've given, and I think we've missed the boat entirely. So how do we fix that? This is what I want to highlight. If we want to engage our people, ladies and gentlemen, if we believe in the narrative that I'm advocating that it's about what people do, not how people feel, then we have to, as leaders, create a people-driven system, right? The power of doing. So if you look at this model, I'm going to hit a couple of things, right? We're going to start with business acumen. To me, a high-performing culture, if you can't answer the question, are we winning or losing, you don't have a high-performing culture. And I mean that literally, right? Too many times I come to events like this and we take the simplest things and we overcomplicate. We hang so many ornaments on that tree that it eventually just collapses, right? Because we, we're smart people, right? That's the thing about these events. We're all smart people, right? How smart can you be? Go look at some of those posters out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to keep it simple, right? And simple as this. I should be able to stand at a yard shack, a time clock, a cafeteria, a break room, an entry exit point, and at the end of my communication cycle, which I'm going to talk about in a second, 
at the end of that communication cycle, I should be able to say, hey, Michael, did we win or lose this week? And Michael's answer isn't predicated on, well, I worked really hard, so I'd say it was a bad week. Mm -hmm. Or I'm really stressed out, not so good. Those answers are the anecdotal answers we get today because there is no business acumen. Right? So how do you get to a place where people understand this? I talked a little bit about this yesterday. One quick metaphor that I want to give you because I would love for y'all to take what you hear this morning and go away and reflect on the way you use metrics in your organization. Mm -hmm. And one quick example I want to give you. What's that picture of? Thermometer. Thermometer. What's that? Thermostat, Thermostat, right? If you're a millennial, you say, I have no idea. That's what <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, this is a simple example, but I think it resonates with a lot of places I go. Many metrics that I see today fall into the category of a thermometer. Now, what's a thermometer do? What does it do? Let's just give it information. I have, I have two sons. I have a soon to be 21 year old and 18 year old. My younger son was not feeling well over the weekend. My wife did the mother thermometer. What's the mother thermometer? Yeah, yeah go up and turn your head. Oh, you feel a little warm, right? She goes and gets me. Sorry, you said that. She goes and gets. <laughs> she goes and gets the thermometer. Is the thermometer going to treat his symptoms? No. It's going to make it. It's going to do nothing, right? It's a passive report. I would argue that in your inbox right now, you all have probably at a minimum of ten, at a maximum of forty different emails with thermometers attached to it. Reports, spreadsheets, data you have no intention of using, reading, reacting to, taking action against. They're just someone's organic thermometer that's been built because they wanted it built and we're not using it. We've got to get to a place where we look at metrics as thermostatic. And I'm going to talk about that today, right? Thermostatic metrics. They give us the thermometer, but they allow us to what? To do something with it, right? So are you using your metrics? Do they feel thermostatic? Now, I'm going to give you a, a couple of cultural cornerstone, what I believe are imperatives, right? A couple of points to take away in this first second. Number one, how would you describe your metrics? Thermometers or thermostats? Number two, it's not about the data. You take nothing else that I say away this morning. I want you to remember these three words, and, it, and I made them so they rhyme, so it's easy, right? Educate, facilitate, motivate. That's what I mean by system of use. Let's, let's just unpack each one of those very quickly. When I say educate, when a new member joins any of your teams, could be a shop floor team, could be a leadership team, could be a supply chain team, an HR team, what's their onboarding look like? What's it look like, right? See, most people, it's, it's pretty good if you think about it transactionally. Look, here's the policies, here's the procedures, here's our products, here's our SKUs, here's where you sit, here's your email, here's your benefits. We do a pretty good job of that. What we do a horrific job with is, welcome to the team, here's how we roll. This group of 10 people, 20 people, here's how we roll. Here are the metrics that matter. Here's what they mean. I was at 3M, 3M's one of our largest accounts. Uh, they heard me speak at a conference a year and a half ago. Their compelling need was, in their tier management system, that tier, tier man, daily management system, tier one is shop floor, tier nine is uh, Mike Roman, the CEO. And they said, tier one, we got supervisors standing in front of folks by their own admission, trying to lead a tier meeting, they don't even know what the business is. They don't know what we're measuring that defines winning and losing. They don't know what the acronyms are, right? How can we put leaders in a situation if we have not educated them on what do these metrics mean? Where do they come from? How do you implement? How do you make them thermostatic, right? That's what I mean by educate. Number two, facilitate. You want to improve meeting effectiveness? Be like the senior executive team advisor that I work with. You walk in, Ian's retired, you walk in their meeting, on the screen when they come in every morning, morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, is the scorecard of how Pfizer performed the previous seven days. That scorecard has 19 line items. That's it, 19 metrics, right? Think about how does a multinational conglomerate have 19 metrics? Because they're intentional and deliberate about building thermostatic metrics. Those metrics are color-coded red or green. I hate yellow and blue and all the other colors that we like to put on stuff, because again, we want to overcomplicate it and make it look really pretty, right? You're winning or you're losing. On Monday, I know, because they run our application, I know Pfizer had three red. That's it, the rest were green. The tone of that meeting's been set before a verbal word is spoken. What's setting the tone of your meetings? See, I think we need to recalibrate meetings entirely. The purpose of a meeting is not team time. The purpose of a meeting is not the socialization and harmonization of your thoughts, in my opinion. The purpose of pulling you away from your valuable work is to hopefully use this forum to move our business forward. 
If that meeting is not moving your business forward, then why are you taking your valuable time to be in there? We have to recalibrate that and say we cannot improve our meeting effectiveness until we let our metrics facilitate the meeting, not the personalities. Right? Some of you all this week, I made a joke yesterday, some of you this week, you're in this conference in Orlando, you have a weekly regular meeting, your team has canceled that meeting. <laughs> Why? Right. Let's be honest, this is going to hurt some people's feelings. Why? Because they say, well, we don't have to do this GoPro radio this week because so and so is not here, and the only reason we have this GoPro radio is to update you because we collectively think you're clueless, all right? And since you're gone and we're here, maybe we can have some what? Have some time to actually get stuff done, right? Now, you're going to call your teacher, did you have your meeting this week? If they say no, don't yell at them, right? But it's a good way to go back and have a conversation with them to say, is this meeting really something that's moving the business forward? Or is it where I get to pontificate and you tell me everything you've done? That's not value added. Last point there, motivate. What do I mean by that? Most scorecards, most metrics today turn to thermometers. Not because they're red, but because they're always green. We see it as a calendar-driven exercise, not an iterative thermostatic process. Pfizer, 3M, they have a non-negotiable cultural cornerstone that says, you're green for 90 days. That triggers a non-negotiable metric review. That metric could go off the scorecard entirely because we've accomplished it. That metric's threshold could now be raised, knowing that next week when we report it, we're probably going to be what? Red, that's okay, I'm good with that. That's a good red. Yeah. They are thermostatically using the metrics to motivate continuous improvement. Do you have a single source of truth? I was in an organization the other day that the CEO said, do not talk about metrics. We've been working on this process for 10 years. We have a scorecard, it looks just like you talked about. I say, great, I would love to see it. Can't wait to attend your meeting. I go in their meeting, the CFO presents the scorecard. It's beautiful, it looks like everything I talk about. The VP of manufacturing raises his hand, calls the CMO had turned his metric red on delivery. He said, did you count the shipment that went out on Sunday night? Because if you counted that shipment, it's probably not red, it's probably green, right? So for 15 minutes, they made calls to this one warehouse, all right, in Alabama. Did the shipment go? Was it in the numbers, right? Forget winning and losing. See, if I don't have a good scorecard, we never get to winning or losing. All we ever get is explanation. We never get to action. It's just explanation, right? How are you using your scorecard? You have a single source of truth. Clearly they did. And are we winning or losing? Let's talk about the second element here, the second cultural cornerstone. Let's go deep on execution and accountability. First thing I want to call out is this comment right here. And I want you thinking about the way you define accountability in your organization. See, sometimes when we talk about accountability, what I'm hearing is we like to soften it up. We like to use words like how people feel, right? We use words like ownership and involvement and engagement and responsibility and accountability. We use it all interchangeably. And I don't think we can do that. Because if accountability is a three things, visible, personal, and measurable, then I'm going to argue it's abstract and ultimately optional. It's the reason many teams today are powered not by collective accountability, but rather selective engagement. So how do we make accountability visible, personal, and measurable? Well, a couple of tenets of this. One, it's predicated first and foremost on the, the thing I just talked about, having a robust business acumen so I can understand winning and losing. That scorecard should be driving your culture of accountability. I will not have a good culture of accountability if I can't connect what people are doing to move the business forward to those metrics that matter. So it's predicated first on good metrics. Secondly, we have to change the narrative. It's not about how you feel. Because that's temporary and fleeting and a moving target will never accomplish. It's about what you've done. What you've done based on what that business acumen process is telling you to move the business forward. And I'm going to show you how to measure that momentarily. We've got to have a way to remove ignorance as an excuse. I hear this a lot. Oh, I didn't understand that. I wasn't here that day. Didn't get that action. Wasn't clear to me. How do you make sure your execution process, again, is visible, personal, measurable, so then, if it's those ways, I can have a good performance management system. Look, when I leave here to go talk at the JHR conference, in their trade show, here's what's going to be in there, right? The latest, greatest performance management software. New questions, new scale, all these things that sound really fancy. Listen, if you don't have data, you can't have a dialogue. And if you can't have a dialogue, you sure can't develop the high performers and the low performers. So how do you have data? Let me show you one quick thing. 
I call it an engagement analysis. If I've got, and we encourage this, 3M does this, Pfizer does this, Philip Morris does this, it's done on a quarterly basis by each leader. You list every person's name on your team. I go to that centralized accountability process, I call it an action register. It's the bolt onto the scorecard. So if we're, if we're right on the scorecard, that action bolts onto that, so I see the connectivity of thermostatic metrics. I list every person's name on my team. I look at the window of review, which is 90 days, and I'm going to count how many actions were taken, how many were completed, and then I, as the leader, I'm going to conduct a little bit of discernment around what was the scope, the complexity, the value of that action to the business. And the way Philip Morris does this, they assign a value to every completed action, low, medium, high. And then I get the cumulative score, I have this report, and then here's the part that makes people a little anxious. I then take that report and I share it to the team in the last meeting of the quarter. Now you want to have anxiety? That's a good way to create it, right? Because I just made accountability visible, personal, and measurable. See, I suggested y'all early on the earlier slide, many teams today are powered by selective engagement. In fact, the biggest demotivating factor in teams today is the visible selective engagement that they see every day when they come to work. We have an obligation to call that out, ladies and gentlemen and leaders. If you really want to change your culture to a culture where the definition of a good culture is predicated on what people do, we have to have the ability to start measuring engagement. This amorphous, nebulous concept that we talk about with engagement doesn't have to be that way. If you, if you understand it's about moving the business forward, we are compelled as leaders to periodically roll up who's engaged in this team. Now, if that were a real team, give me a couple of observations. What's a couple of, if that were a real team? Wendy and John, Wendy? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Wendy, Patricia, and John, right? And that 90-day period of time, they never volunteered for, nor what? We didn't nor were assigned or anything, right? right? I basically allowed them to be a meeting tourist, right? Through the entire process, I never asked them for anything, I never engaged them, and I think this is the reality of a lot of leaders today. I don't want to go, why do you think I'm not going to Wendy and Patricia and John? Why do you think? Maybe I've just decided that it's hopeless, right? They're, maybe they're difficult. Maybe they're problematic, right? I can give you any number of reasons. So I'm intentionally not going to them. I'm managing this team by personality, but I'm going to who? Thank God I've got who? Frank, right? Thank God I've got Gwen's getting some stuff done. Linda, you know, she had A, she delivered three. There's an opportunity. There. I got five things there that if I really want to use this data for engagement, I need to say to Linda, you know what, Linda, don't worry about those other five. I'm taking those back, and I'm going to what? I'm going to give them to John, Patricia, and Gwen, right? I've been waiting for self-actualization. It ain't happening, so I'm dropping it, okay? Now, here's the funny part of this. Most teams, if you ask them, they can tell you exactly that. They may not be able to quantify it numerically, but I promise you, every team will say, this person is you. This is your go-to person. This is the person that, you know, they'll do stuff, but you're going to have to handhold it. And these are the folks who you're very not just don't waste your breath, right? Because it's not going to get done. Okay, ma'am. How do you reconcile this approach with, like, as you start to talk about agile and self-organizing teams and team commitments, not individual commitments, and all of the other philosophies that then somewhat conflict a little bit with? Let me give you one quick answer on that. Those actions are built <laughs> on your scorecard. It's the scorecard driving those actions because that's the critical things that help us win, both as teams and as individuals. The problem with, with the question is if I don't have a scorecard, I can gain that because I can just volunteer for the things I like or the things I, I'm passionate about. I mean, I, you've got to have the prerequisite of that scorecard driving that because that's what holds the team together. That's a great question, right? Yes, ma'am, Shane, the other thing is don't you have to apply your body slants too? Because Wendy and John and Patricia and Gwen, they have all these different um, You might already have a bias towards them, so you're, you're swaying the work to Frank and Linda because just like you and you know they're yeah. going to drive it just like you. I love that question, Mark, because I agree we do have a bias. I mean, that whole idea of selective engagement is often driven by the leader because I, I like Frank, we think alike, we have the Jedi mind meld, and it's easy for me to go to that person, right? And that's why I think it's real important that when you show this data, right, 
You show it to yourself first, and you, you maybe even have a colleague, a coach, say, well, what are you really doing here, Shane? Are you intentionally disengaging from these folks because of your history, your perceptions? It's great. It's a great conversation to have. The data drives that conversation. That's what I want, okay? Real quick, because I'm going to be out of time. Uh, cornerstones of this process. What have I said here? Visible, personal, measurable accountability. I just showed you how to do that, right? Doing, not feeling. Thermostatic execution. Last thing is this idea of communication process, last imperative. Listen, we have got to get our head around and our hands around the current state of meetings in our, in our mind. And there's two meetings that we've got to make sure we've got discipline around. I am a huge advocate of a daily management system that actually works, right? And this is a model of what I'm talking about that's metric driven. That, that, that there's a flow and a process and that it's relevant and meaningful. And if I run that daily management system or tier meeting, if I run it with business acumen and clear execution and clear accountability and communication, it can work for us, right? Too often I've seen, this was 3M's story, this daily management system went sideways. It just became about communicating information up so the next level can answer any question they might be asked, right? The metrics weren't owned at the appropriate level. It was just a generation and proliferation of metrics all the way up to tier nine. So if anybody in St. Paul has asked a question, you might have heard it already. That is not the point of a good daily management system. But we also have to reconcile our weekly functional scorecard. And they need to intersect at a level in the organization that we can use this process to get on offense, not defense. Our data says that most leaders spend 25 to 32 percent of their week reiterating and recommunicating. Just in different forms and fashions. We've got to get on offense. I'm coming, Keith. We've got to get on offense with that. So, what's the cultural cornerstone here? You can get to six hours. We have clients that are there today, but you've got to get those communication processes fully built fully aligned in the methodology I'm talking about. You've got to deconstruct it to reconstruct it. I would encourage you to start doing this. This is an easy takeaway. Every meeting you go to now, ask this question. At the time we spent in this meeting, did it move our business forward? Ask people at the end of a work week, did we win or lose? See what kind of answer you get, right? So I began, I'm ending, I began with this slide. We've got to stop worrying about how people feel and focus on what people do. I'm ending with this because I believe this passionately. If we build a non-negotiable cultural cornerstone environment that shows people the visible and personal acts of doing, then I believe we connect them to that obligation I said we had as leaders. Clarity, connectivity, and consistency. And at the end of the day, if I can see how I'm doing, if I can see how I move the business forward, it's going to translate to me feeling Hey, this is, a, this is good, right? I like my coworkers, I like myself, I like my team, I like my future, I like my employer. I think we just gotta reverse it, y'all. That's my bottom line. We gotta reverse our thinking and we gotta put systems and processes in place that define doing, because in the act of doing, we create a culture that's sustainable. I'd love for y'all to stop by my booth, it's booth 14, I am gonna be giving away some of my books. Uh, these are some of the services that we offer as a firm and would love to talk to you if any of my message resonated today. I will be at the booth to take questions because I know I'm taking all the time, right? Thank you, Keith, for having me. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> Thank you guys.